So in this lesson, we will talk about one more scheduling problem and a greedy solution for that problem. We will also look at a new way to prove the optimality of a greedy algorithm. It is uh, referred to as the exchange argument. It's, it's very interesting and um, you can use it also for uh, several other problems. We have section 4.2 from our textbook that, that covers this topic. The scheduling problem we will discuss um, has to do with, uh, again, a single uh, machine, a single resource that you are uh, trying to schedule as efficiently as possible. The jobs this time, they have a, a, a processing time and a deadline. So you can assume that all the jobs are available from the very beginning. When you go to work in the morning, you have all of the jobs and they are all available. Um, but for the job J, you know its duration, TJ, and you know when it is due. But uh, these deadlines, as we will see, they are actually soft. What does that mean? If you start a job, J, if you can get into it at the time SJ, then of course it will finish at SJ plus the duration of the job, right? So the question is, is that finish time before or after the deadline? If it is before the deadline, the deadline has been met and there is no penalty. If, however, you finish the job sometime after the deadline, then this difference here, the finish time minus the deadline is positive, which means that the lateness of that job is positive, it's not zero. So the idea is that the more uh, late a job is, the less you get paid, right? The less is the, the value that you get out of the schedule. And so your goal is to schedule the jobs so that you minimize the maximum lateness across all jobs that you have. Of course, you can think about other variations of this problem. For instance, one variation would be that you try to minimize the summation of all of these latenesses. Uh, you can think about a variation in which the deadlines are hard and if you cannot really meet a deadline, then um, you cannot uh, even do it. Um, there are many, many variations, but for now I want us to focus on, on this specific uh, instance of the problem. So let's look at an example. Just to uh, illustrate, we have here six jobs. We see their um, duration, their processing time, and we see their deadline. So here is a schedule for all of these jobs. Uh, I'm not claiming that this is optimal or that it has any other property. I'm just showing you a schedule. We schedule job uh, number three first. Uh, finish time of this job will be the start time plus the duration. And the lateness of this job is, is what? Because the deadline is at nine, and the job finishes at 1, so the job is not late, so the lateness is 0. Similarly, you can uh, do the same thing for um, job number 2. There is no lateness, job number 6. Now, for job number 1, it actually finishes at what time? The time that it started, which is, which is um, 5, plus uh, its duration, which is um, 3. Now, the deadline for this job was 6, which means that the lateness of this job is uh, 2, the finish time minus the, the deadline. So this has a lateness, but if you continue with uh, the schedule, you could see that there is another job, job 4, that has an even higher lateness, which is 6. So this schedule if you want to evaluate how, how good or how bad it is, you will say that its maximum lateness is 6. We're trying to come up with a schedule that minimizes this maximum lateness. As we discussed in the previous class, there is not really a single greedy algorithm typically. Um, there is a greedy approach and within that general greedy approach, you can think of uh, different algorithms. So uh, let's look at a couple of these different ideas and, and try to ask whether they are actually uh, good ideas or not. As we did in the previous class, we can use counterexamples. If you try to schedule the jobs in terms of 
shortest processing time first right this makes sense uh, because you want to get uh, uh, as many jobs as possible out of the way well it may not be a good idea because some of these short jobs may have a, a very late deadline for instance consider the example here with job one and job two um, the deadline of job one is 100 right uh, even though the deadline of job number two is exactly equal to the duration of that job so if you first do uh, job number one, which has the shortest processing time, then job number two would have a lateness of one. If you would first do um, job number two, of course it would not have any lateness, and job one would also uh, would not have any lateness. So that would be in this example the optimal thing to do. Here is another idea. How about we find the slack time of each job, which is the difference between the deadline and, and how long the job takes. Again, this seems intuitive that you want to first do the jobs that have a small slack time. So in this case, uh, the job number two would have the smallest slack time. So if you do that first, then the finish time of job number one will be when it starts at time 10 plus its um, duration but given that the deadline of that job is 2 the lateness of that job will be 9 if however you first do job number 1 and uh, then you store, start uh, job number 2 that uh, job will have a lateness of 1 and so you will have a much lower lateness so clearly this heuristic is, is not the optimal either. Here is a third idea, a third greedy idea, that uh, probably you are using quite a bit in your schoolwork. I'm guessing you are doing the homework that has the earliest deadline first. You focus on the next deadline. If we apply this approach in this previous example that I showed you with the six jobs, um, you will see basically that uh, we order the jobs in terms of deadline. As you can see here, we have a couple of jobs that have the same deadline. And if you go through the example, I hope it's clear by now that um, you will get a lateness, the maximum lateness, of only one. If you try to think about counterexamples that show that this approach is not optimal, you will actually fail. So I suggest you don't do that for more than a few minutes. Because it turns out that this approach, the earliest deadline first approach, is actually optimal, at least in this formulation that, that we consider here. But of course we will have to prove that, don't take my word for it. Now the algorithm itself, as you can imagine, it's, it's super simple. We just uh, sort the jobs in terms of deadline. And, uh, then we go through them one by one. Uh, this variable t keeps track of time, so initially time is zero. So we take the first job, the, the job with the smallest deadline, and we schedule it so that it starts at time t. Of course initially time t is zero. It finishes at time t plus the duration of the job. And then we advance time to the finish time of that job. Uh, and repeat, right? We take the next job, again we schedule it. Of course notice that scheduling the jobs in this manner does not create any gaps between the jobs. When one job finishes, the next one immediately starts. And eventually we uh, report this uh, schedule of, of jobs, right? This um, sequence of intervals. So the algorithm is very simple. Of course, it's big O and log N because of the sorting operation. Now, the big question is, why is this thing optimal? So to construct our proof, we will first come up with a couple of observations that will help us understand the structure of both an optimal solution for this problem as well as the structure of the solution produced by the greedy algorithm. So the first thing that you can um, see very easily is that we can have multiple optimal solutions, multiple solutions that give you the same maximum, late, maximum lateness. For example, here in these two schedules, in both of them, none of the jobs is, is actually late. So uh, you would argue that both of them are, are equally optimal. However, my, my main point here is that if you consider all of these optimal schedules, there is always an optimal schedule that doesn't have any idle time 
what is idle time? It's basically when your resource, when your machine stays idle, even if there is still work to be done, even if there are still jobs that have to be processed. For example, here the first uh, schedule has idle time. The second schedule doesn't have any idle time because its job starts immediately after the previous ends. If we consider all the optimal schedules, there exists at least one optimal schedule that doesn't have any idle time because introducing idle time can only increase the lateness, can never decrease the lateness. The second thing that I want you to see is that our greedy algorithm, by definition, by construction, doesn't really create any idle time because, as you saw, it schedules the jobs one after the other. The second thing I want you to understand is that the greedy algorithm, as we saw, it always schedules jobs in increasing sequence of uh, deadlines. The question is, is it possible that an optimal solution actually doesn't do that? Is it possible that an optimal solution has inversions? Now, what do I define as inversions? We say that we have an inversion in a schedule. If you can find a pair of jobs, at least one pair of jobs, let's say I and J, such that I is scheduled before J, even though I has a larger deadline, a later deadline than J. So whenever that happens, we say that the schedule has an inversion. Now, clearly the greedy algorithm does not have inversions, but the question is, <clears throat> what happens with the optimal solution? Can it have any inversions? If a schedule, forget whether it is optimal or not, if we have a schedule that has no idle time and it has one or more inversions, then we can certainly find one inversion in that schedule in which the jobs I and J are consecutive. J is scheduled immediately after I. How to think about this? If you had the situation that you have the job I and then some um, other jobs that do not create inversion with I and then you had the job J, that creates an inversion with I. The fact that this job doesn't have an inversion with I it means that the deadline of this job is larger than the deadline of I. Then the same thing would be about the same thing would be true about this job. It would have a larger deadline than this one and than the deadline of I. But then we know that the deadline of J is less than the deadline of I. So we would have actually um, these two jobs having an inversion. So whenever a schedule has an inversion, you can always find two consecutive jobs, like this one and, and J, that form an inversion. So now we have reached the most interesting part of the proof. What have we seen so far? We have seen that the greedy algorithm doesn't create idle time and doesn't create inversions. And we have seen that you can always find an optimal schedule that doesn't have idle time, and if it has inversions, you can always find an inversion between two consecutive uh, jobs. So what we will prove now is that if you have an inversion in a schedule, let's say the optimal schedule, between two consecutive jobs, then you can swap those jobs, you can exchange their position in the schedule, and you will not increase the, the maximum lateness. So you will not make the solution suboptimal. If it was previously optimal, it will continue to be optimal. Imagine here that I have the optimal schedule uh, including an inversion between two consecutive jobs, I and J. Now, suppose that I, the only change I make is that I change the order of jobs J and I. I don't change anything else. I will use the notation for anything that happens after I do this change, I will use a prime. So F prime I is the new finish time of job I after I have swapped them with jobs uh, with job J. So of course the first thing you can see also visually here is that the finish time of job J in the original schedule and the finish time of job I in the new schedule, they are equal because I have just changed the position of these two jobs. They were previously consecutive, they are still consecutive but in different order and remember there is no idle time. 
What happens to the lateness of all the other jobs? Let's say the lateness of any job k for k that is different than i and j. Well, the lateness has not changed. It is what it was before because I haven't really touched any other job. It's still at the same time. The lateness of the job j, what happens to that after I have moved it earlier in the schedule? Well, since I moved it earlier in the schedule, it cannot increase, right? It is basically less or equal than the lateness of that job in the original schedule. And what happens to the lateness of the job I after I did the swap? Well, let's say that job I is late after uh, we did the swap. So what does that mean? That this difference is the finish time of job I after I did the swap minus the deadline of that job. But this finish time, as we discussed here, it is equal to fj minus di. Now this is lower or equal than fj minus dj. Why? Because remember dj is smaller than di. That's how we define the inversion, right? We said that uh, the deadline of job j is smaller than the deadline of job i. And so if we are subtracting here something that is uh, smaller than this, uh, the inequality should be in this direction. Now what is fj minus uh, dj? That is uh, smaller or equal than the lateness of job j. Why do I say smaller or equal? Maybe that this difference is negative. So in that case, of course, you know, um, this negative number um, would be less than zero. So in general, what we saw here is that the lateness of job um, J has not increased. The lateness of job I after we do the swap also has not become larger than the lateness of job J before the swap. So putting these two things together, we reach the conclusion that the maximum lateness across all the jobs, including I and J, has not increased after the swap between uh, I and J. We're almost done with the proof. What we have shown so far is that if you have an optimal schedule, a schedule that minimizes the maximum lateness, then if there is an inversion in that schedule, you can always find an inversion between two consecutive jobs. You can swap the position of those jobs and by doing that you don't increase the maximum lateness. So the schedule remains optimal. What if the schedule has multiple inversions, not only an inversion between jobs i and j, but perhaps also an inversion here between job uh, i prime and, and j prime or, or something else, then you can keep doing the same thing. You can apply always the same exchange argument where you take these two consecutive jobs that create an inversion, swap them, and you wouldn't increase the maximum lateness. So if you keep doing that, then um, you would have a schedule that doesn't have any inversions, it is still optimal, and it doesn't have any gaps because we started with an optimal schedule that doesn't have any gaps. But wait a second, this is actually the schedule produced by the greedy algorithm. A schedule that doesn't have gaps, it doesn't have inversions, and we just now showed that this schedule will also be optimal. That concludes our proof that the earliest deadline first greedy algorithm is optimal. But be careful here, we only proved this for this specific formulation where the deadlines are not hard and you're trying to minimize the maximum lateness. There are other formulations of the scheduling problem in which the deadlines are hard and, and there are other uh, variations of the problem and in those cases the earliest deadline first uh, algorithm is not always optimal. So uh, be cautious about applying the theorem that we just saw in different formulations.